Good morning. Um, my name is Paul Kirst. Um, <clears throat> I've been a member of this group for a couple of years, and today I'm going to do a real brief presentation of um, on the a book that I've enjoyed. I enjoyed very much uh, the Ministry for the Future, written by one of my favorite science fiction authors, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I guess the one caveat is uh, I I did not go too thoroughly into the book because I didn't want to create any spoilers for people who are reading and, and enjoying it. Uh, and I did definitely oriented it towards generating some discussion afterwards. So, as I said earlier, this, um, this is going to be on the book, uh, book written by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, science fiction, multiple award-winning science fiction author. Uh, the book is uh, called The Ministry for the Future. Um, and uh, I think that not only this, I think this book not only is about uh, this entity called The Ministry for the Future, but I think it also gives us a, I'd say there's a possibility of, a, it does give a peek at at one person's version of what a world in transition into a more integral society would look like. People may or may not agree with me on that, but. So on the surface, the story, you know, at the 60,000 or 30,000 foot level, the book follows uh, an international organization named the Ministry for the Future in its mission to advocate for the world's future generations um, as, their, as if they, their rights were as valid as the, as the rights of the present generation. And again, in the book, the, this, this ministry began in 2025. That was established as, as a subsidiary body under the Paris Agreement, um, based in, it's based in Zurich, and it's being led, the, and the main protagonist is a woman by the name of Mary Murphy, um, who is, a, a former foreign minister for Ireland. And, and it's this, the, the main story of, of, of the book is about climate change is established as a threat that compromises the safety and prosperity of the future. And the plot really follows Murphy as she seeks to convince uh, central banks of the threats to currency and market stability posed by the effects of climate change. Um, and it's specifically a coordinated global round of qualitative easing through the issuance of complementary currency uh, called carbon coin in the book with high discounted rates to be exchanged for future for carbon capture is adopted. And that's kind of the central story that line that's followed. And at the same time in the story, there's a there's a another strain where they're talking about what at at in Antarctica uh, there's various countries cooperating in the geoengineering project to drill to the bottom of the glaciers and pump meltwater up to slow the basal slide of, of the, the giant glaciers in the Antarctica so that's kind of the story from a 30,000 foot level now having said that it's not a typical novel um, Robinson, uh, who is called uh, by the, the New Yorker, the greatest political novelist of our time, uh, he wanted, he said he wanted to write a story with an international scope with characters who provided explanations for how and why institutions and systems work the way they do and how they might change. And that really did not lend itself to a standard structure of a novel. It just, he had determined it just really wouldn't work for him. And so he ultimately wrote a book that was 560 pages long, uh, but it had 106 short chapters. And while much of the storyline is carried forward in standard novel form through the interactions of the four main characters, including Mary Murphy, um, there's a lot of those cha short chapters he he really brings in various other modes of writing particularly unnamed characters providing eyewitness accounts uh, also um, 
it took the form. There were numerous essays in the book, uh, dramas played out. There were dialogues that were that were that were depicted, uh, radio interviews, or even some riddles that he threw out in the middle of the book. And this the story itself it kicked off in the very first chapter, which kind of shocked shocked me, and I understand it shocked a lot of people who started the book. It started with a huge life condition change that really kicked off the whole process. And in the opening chapter, six months after the actually six months after the establishment of the ministry, so you know, late 2025, uh, in the in the book, a monster uh, heat wave hits northern India that literally parboils to death 20 million people over the span of one week. And that shocks the country to the core. And through that process, because of that, and you get in the story, India sweeps out old corrupt political models, takes the lead in, in uh, climate change, and truly embraces uh, regenerative economics and zero carbon. So that's that was kind of the the kickstart of the book. And then you really got into the whole a, a lot of the a lot of the book was really about how do we transition out of um, neoliberal capitalism and 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 then also how do you do it in book form without creating a post apocalyptic uh, dystopian hellhole. And I think that he did a pretty good job of that overall. Um, and he did it in a way that I call he did it by depicting a th death of, of the system by a thousand cuts over one entire lifetime. And Robinson introduces a multiplicity of game changing concepts and structures, technologies, you know, all working cumulatively to bring about really big, ultimately really big change to the cyst, to the whole global system, but it takes place over the course of 40 years. And, and I just want to mention a few and just go into just a couple of, a few of the, the things that he talks about. Um, and he goes fairly deeply from several different angles that essentially get at the whole idea of how, how do you end the billionaires? How do you eliminate billionaires from the planet? He really goes pretty deeply into uh, at several different levels into the whole issue of climate terrorism. And, and I thought one of the most interesting ways that he weaved this, this, this whole thing was he used a real world model, the Mondragon um, Cooperative Corporation that actually exists in Spain. And he used that, it's, he basically said, this is a model that will proliferate throughout the entire globe. Uh, you know, a way to, to reformulate organizations or corporations. So the whole idea of how do you end the ultra wealthy class? And I just, you know, and he talks about, you know, a whole series of things, you know, wage ratio movements, uh, global progressive tax system, job guarantees. Uh, it gets into real deep detail about, you know, unfolding a global blockchain currency. Um, and, then, and then he goes into, a lot of detail about how the the ability to hide money now in the world is really supports the system as it exists, and how did that how did the world go about eliminating this ability uh, to hide money? And again, as I said, he he did in a lot of ways go very deeply into this whole issue of what I call severe climate terrorism. And he did it right away by introducing this, this organization that was birthed out of the Indian heat wave disaster called the Children of Kali. And some of the things that the Children of Kali did over the span of the book was, um, you know, they, they instituted, you know, they coordinated and executed um, the the crashing of simultaneous crashing of 60 passenger jets around the world o over a matter of just a few hours. Um, it, during the book, container ships were mysteriously sinking, always 
interestingly enough, always close to land. And they didn't go in a lot of detail, but they, you know, in several different ways, they talked about how, you know, they're rich people who got very rich off of polluting the planet, literally got hunted down and killed by drones. Um, and this, again, this was not a major theme in the story, but it was part of the storyline that I thought was pretty interesting. But he also went into this whole issue of, uh, you know, a world filled with worker-owned enterprises, and as I say, welcome to Turquoise. Um, and again, it's, it was this, he uses the model, that this Mondragon um, Cooperative Co Corporation, which, you know, it's an actual corporation uh, headquartered in northern Spain, and that, that, that holds billions of euros in assets and makes millions of euros in profits every year. Um, and they do it through, I mean, they're really dedicated to the concept of, of social co uh, cooperatives, you know, democratic organization. They really, you know, exercise and, and live out the sovereignty of labor in the process. Uh, they, their approach to capital is not, it's the ultimate goal, but capital is an, has an instrumental and subordinate nature. It, it supports the process. It's not the reason for the process. Uh, very strong in, in participatory management and very, very engaged in social transformation. And, and again, what happens in the book is that one of the ways that the change is brought to the whole system is that the planet literally fills up with enterprises that follow this very real world, very successful model. And it's no longer as it is now, it's not, Right now, it's a real shining example, but it, it transitions into a, a pervasive and preferred model throughout the planet. And uh, so the, the novel, in the, in the novel, no single event or action changes the world, not even the death of millions. Rather, it, it's a it is the dif different sequences of choices that nudge humans individually and collectively in new directions. You know, first choices force the next choices that force more choices. And then it's just this, this domino effect that's depicted in, in, in novel form that occurs. You know, now, Robin, Robinson is a, a practicing Buddhist, and I really have no idea whether he knows anything about spiral dynamics at all. But I felt that the book itself, at least from my perspective, it, you know, it displays a very deep sense of the evolutionary forces that are depicted at the core of what sp the spiral dynamics model presents. Um, you know, the whole idea of you know, change begets change begets change, which is, you know, core is central to the spiral, spiral dynamics model uh, is just weaved very deeply into the book. So I, I just want to throw out a couple of questions, a few questions to consider here. I'm just about done. First one is, what do you think and feel about a world without billionaires? What do you, what are the forces that you're aware of that will push and pull against a world where enough should be a human right and that there's a floor below which no one can fall, but also there's a ceiling above which no one can rise. And then also, what, do you, what are your feelings about acts of climate terrorism that could ultimately kill tens of thousands of innocent people? Uh, do you believe that the that, that dramatic changes needed to abate the climate crisis will be achieved without extreme acts of terrorism. And then what do you think would need to be true for an agency like the Ministry of the Future to be effective? And again, one, one final question. In the book, Robinson uh, dedicated the book <clears throat> to his doctoral supervisor, Frederick Jameson, who made the following quote. It is now easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. 
So I guess my final question is, why do you suppose we seem to feel this quote is so true? Thank you. Now, how do I stop share? Now, nice presentation, Paul, and I love your questions. Your questions you. are really making me think very deeply. And that last quote is a quote that I've been wanting to share on Facebook for a while because I, I do think it's very true. It is easier to imagine the end of, wor of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. So very good questions, Paul. So I guess we're gonna do a general group discussion. Oh, Bet is quick to the draw. She's the first with a comment, Bet. Awesome, so nice to be a participant today. I, okay, so great job not doing too many spoilers because I'm only a little bit into this book. Um, and so I really am glad you didn't do too much. And I would love to complain about the format of the book, but that'll be up for another discussion. Um, I really, I, the stunning thing is, is that they're using capitalism, the market, this carbon car so i don't think that this thing is removing it i don't think that that's what's happening but okay so the questions again i took a picture of it let me go look at my picture i keyed on the issue of how, how in in the book the the wealthy class was the world was no longer dominated by the well by a wealthy mm -hmm. class and then mm -hmm. the, the, the whole question around uh Severe, not just uh, climate terrorism, but severe climate terrorism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final one was, why do we, why are we not able to um, seem to be able to envision the end of capitalism? We're, we're, most of our discussions is talking about, oh my God, we're going to kill ourselves through climate change. I mean, we just can't, we can't, we don't seem to be able to imagine that capitalism is going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so the first one, a world without billionaires, it's, uh, I don't really like that. And I don't know if it's because I'm not very developed or if it's because I think naturally people want to save things and keep them and try to better themselves just naturally. And any system that has tried to, to deter that has ended up there's a lot of really bad problems thinking about like communism, communism, for instance. And so I don't know if I'm just not developed yet or, or what, but I don't like that personally. And I think it's better to leverage that desire to gain and build these things like carbon coins. I really like the carbon coin. And I've been thinking a lot about that actually before this book, how can you incentivize because that's a good thing and not so much it doesn't always have to be money it could be like honor and glory which is something i've learned in postmasters people really do a lot for honor and glory <laughs> it's like the only thing we have to give in, in postmasters we don't pay anyone so there are a lot of other kind of incentives um so that we could, we could leverage that but i think having someone you know money is a store in value and being able to use that so if you say like you can only get this much money then right away you just incentivize and people are just going to gamify they're going to find ways to hide value that people don't know so I, I think the first question is i don't like that i think it's not a good thing and i think we need to leverage the desires of humans to do better let me see let me go back what's the second question um okay I really do not like violence. I do not like violence at all. And again, I don't know if I'm not developed enough. I don't think that's the truth. I'm very much against it. Um, I understand the idea of like the end justifies means, but I would rather use the, uh, the incentives, the good things. Okay, next question. Um, I, I do think that narratives need to come out so that this ministry of the future, like I think we need to start with this ministry. I really, I'm excited about it. And I think the more people who watch this kind of video that we're making today, and the more people who understand about this book, this could be the thing that helps the world go get this ministry of the future. And then, you know, we have to start figuring out how to move off of carbon 
So the last question, what was the last question, Paul? You, you know, I just, I just threw out the, the quote by- um, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Tom, Tom. So I, don't, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Well, no, <clears throat> I was struck by it because I, you know, it really hit me personally. I, I struggle with this issue of, and we, you know, we've I've displayed that struggle often in, in this, this forum. Um, capitalism as it exists now, and I'm not, I'm not attacking the, the broad concept of what capitalism has been or could be in the future, but capitalism as it exists right now, uh, under its current manifestation is what's destroying the world. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the core cause of it. And yet we seem to, but I'm caught, I can't imagine it end, ending. It's far easier for me to think about how the world will come to an end, you know, than it would, how do we, how do we move off our current course? And you know, that, that's that's all I was trying to to get at with that mm -hmm. final question. Okay, so my answer to the final question is that I have been thinking about this a lot about how society has changed. I think it's just obvious that over time, we as a culture change our values, and we decide. I guess kind of moving up the spiral, we decide this next value is more important to us than some other value. So instead of trying to change capitalism, which I think is just the way humans work of trying to learn how to make something valuable and how to get more of it, I think it's better just to change what we value and just say, the earth is the most important thing. We have to live on this planet. Let's try to figure out how to make it safe for a long time. And then that's the most valuable thing. And then instead of hurting the earth, we all are just working to make the earth better. I, I think it's just a very simple value change that, that maybe this book can help us all do versus like, let's destroy capitalism. Like, let, let's not ruin the system that this is how humans work. Let's just make the values different. And then it's already there and all this carbon coin and everything is just ready to go. I, maybe I'm just oversimplifying, but Maybe I'm a hopeful person too. All right, I'm done. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Josh, you're up next. Yeah, well, I appreciate your presentation. I haven't read the book. I, I may read it. Um, so I'm a, a writer and I've been writing in the speculative world, but it's horror fiction. And I recently just wrote an eco horror novel, which I'm trying to pitch to publishers. We'll see. The thing is, I, yeah, I'm surprised he got that out there because, well, he, he was a prominent author to begin with. And it's like, that's, those are the only folks who are really going to be able to get radical stuff like that out through the gatekeepers. Although maybe it's changing and his book, I'm hoping will pave the way for, look, people are into this kind of ecological fiction. There, there's been some in the past, of course, it's just not super well known. There's a book called Ecotopia by Ernest Collenbach written many years ago, which was kind of the envisioning a different world kind of thing. And then Ed Abbey had written a lot, of, but really most, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to come up with a very popular ecological fiction scenario. So that's, I'm really glad that he, he did that in regards to some of the specific stuff that were brought up. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've also been a environmental organizer for a long time. I've stepped away and then I come back and I'm sort of even in denial that I'm, I'm still doing it, but I still am, I guess, and more blatantly these days. And so I think all these pieces are, are really interesting and, and curious about how he lays it all out. But I do think it's important to remember that climate change is just one subset of the larger ecological crisis. And what I've seen is that the climate movement is obviously one of the most important pieces, but it's totally taken over the whole environmental movement to the point where there's actually a lot of advocacy for things that 
in the opinion of folks who have been doing environmentalism for many years ago or some of the worst things ever, which is like cutting forests down and burning it for energy as a pretend climate solution, advocating for a bunch of nuclear power, which is some of the most harmful substances that will last almost literally forever. So I just, I, I just want to caution people about, remember, folks were fighting this all sorts of environmental issues before climate change came on board. So it's not like climate change alone would solve everything, even if we were to fix it, um, which is quite a tall order. But regarding some of your questions there, so the billionaire thing, I don't want to be a billionaire. I'm not a huge fan of the billionaires that we have, but I think that's a red herring because I've seen some analysis of if you take all the money of all those billionaires, it's away from them, it's not going to make a dent in anything, really. You know, I think the biggest issue with billionaires is that they're just way too influential on the political and social scene. But that's people's fault because for some reason they won't hear what a billionaire has to say. I don't, I don't quite get that. But I think that's a little bit of a red herring. And just like, a, like, let's just fight the billionaires. It's like, all right, add all that up. Is it like, what, $1 trillion? It's like, it's, it's, it's less than, you know, they have more money than certain governments, but not hardly compared to bigger country governments. So I don't know if that, that focus is more just like a rah, rah, fight some bad guy stuff. I, I don't find it as interesting, but sure, you put taxes in place to make it so you can't be a billionaire. I don't care. <laughs> The terrorism thing, so let's be very delicate here because this is being recorded. So look back to a group called ELF, the Earth Liberation Front, back in the early mid-2000s, and they were deemed the number one terrorist threat by the FBI. They did solely property destruction, so they didn't actually go after humans at all. They did property destruction, and then they did something to do with Bureau of Land Management. So then all of a sudden it became terrorism because terrorism has to be having a government target per se. If you're just going after businesses, it doesn't quite fall under those definitions. It can. Anyway, they were wiped out of existence for a handful of, they burned down some horse corrals. They did something for a ski resort. They, they torched a couple logging equipment and stuff like that. But they were, yeah, they were made the number one domestic terrorist threat by the FBI. Not only did they get disappeared, anyone who knew them or was affiliated, I was basically like three degrees of separation, was like, so it's it's not it's not a great idea. And certainly I personally think anything that's violent is against human beings is is a wrong thing to do and, and tends to get you more does far more harm than good, does not really work politically per se. And just think about, so would like eco well-meaning people actually engage in terrorism? Um, have, have you seen any acts of say, like even violence against people who are say deliberately spreading disease during a pandemic? There's been none, all the violence has been on, on the other side. I haven't seen one act of say somebody punching an anti-masker, right? It's always the uh, opposite. So. I don't think that that's even going to happen. I, I don't think that the, the entities that have the values of earth protection are going to end up resorting to violence. So I think that's also kind of a, <clears throat> a non-starter. And then regarding the capitalism thing, I'm not a fan of capitalism, but at the same time, capitalism has, like Bet said, it's raised a fair amount of people out of poverty. It, it is the structure we have right now. Um, I think there should be other structures experimented with personally, but I think that the focus on just let's smash capitalism and, you know, well, okay, well, what, what is the alternative? Like, well, communism is like, so a government run communism is gonna be better for the environment. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, Again, I'm open to experiments with different things, but I really think to figure out, so it's, it's ego leads to economy, which leads to ecology destruction, right? So ego, eco, eco. And I think that, yes, anyone who is dealing with environmental issues without looking at 
the economic drivers behind that is an incomplete analysis. So I think that premise is completely sound. However, I think the idea of we'll just switch our economy. What is the drive behind the accumulation? What is the drive behind the idea of I need to be better than my neighbor? What is the drive behind having all of these winner take all rewards? I investigated this in my, my novel, which is why I have a feeling it's not going to get published because it's that's not what people really want to talk about. But I think that if we're going to, to conclude my, my rant, if we're going to really deal with ecological issues in the economy, we have to look at what are those driving forces inside of it as individuals that make me want to have that bigger, better, not just comfort, not just security, which is everyone's desire. And I think we can easily create a world, not easily, we could create a world with that. But why does one person always want to be like, oh, he's got that security? Eh, I'm going to be one step above that. What are the rewards in place? And once you start looking at that, you'll realize that almost everything in our social structure is based on rewarding those who, despite what we say, who rise up in the hierarchy. So until we acknowledge that we ourselves pat people on the back for rising up in these hierarchies, that we ourselves are driven to do that. And this is not an argument for, it is a good thing therefore, but we have to acknowledge that it's in ourselves and maybe to say, why do, I, why do I keep doing this? How can I maybe change that if that's possible? So that's all I got. And thanks Paul for the presentation. Thanks Josh. And thank, I, I don't want to address the directly the question that you asked uh, at the end, but uh, somewhere uh, inside your presentation, you ask, I don't know, I'm not aware if uh, the writer is a knowledge of spiral dynamic. And I want to address this because I think uh, that definitely he wasn't because uh, um, there are few, a basic understanding that you receive from spiral dynamic that he didn't address to. Uh, of course, it's very good that he is imagining uh, a utopia, or it's it's really important to to ask question: How can we make society better? I think this is a great uh, book, but the solutions uh, that he is imagining imagining are all about structure. And when we are talking about spiral dynamic, especially in uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, supporting, we always take care of the um, culture, the motivation, and then the start the structure. The change must start with the motivations of people. And at, at least from your presentation, it seems that he's focusing on structures. Second of all is uh, coloring some aspect in good or bad, like billionaires is bad, climate change is uh, bad, and this is good, which in spiral dynamic, we always look at healthy and unhealthy. Billionaires can be healthy and can, be, can express themselves in an unhealthy way. So the change is not about uh, eliminating things, it's just about uh, directing them and uh, assist them to express themselves, themselves in a healthy way. And I don't see him thinking about it at all. And about the, uh, uh, the Magron and the Medragon, the Spanish uh, uh, cooperative, what's his name? I believe it's pronounced Madragon. Madragon, yeah. I read about Did I get I it right? About, yeah, Madragon. I read about them a few times. And from my perspective, the values uh, is over in this organization is mostly blue. It's not like a revolutionary, really revolutionary structure that will change the world. There are better ones. So, this is my insight. And I think if somebody wants to tell a story about a better world, uh, it's probably should be uh, 
take on consideration uh, those stuff that I just uh, explained. That's it. Thank you, Safir. Thank you very much. That's good, good insight. And, and go, ahead, go ahead, Veronica. First, I might, I must add another cat to my collection. You can address me as the queen of the felines. You must bow to me now. Bow, bow. <laughs> okay, anyway. Okay, so what were the questions? Um, terrorism. I'm gonna get into a lot of trouble, but since I'm holding a cat, I can be evil. I can say evil things now. So I think maybe, okay, I'm totally against the killing of humans or the harming of humans, absolutely 100%. Um, sometimes though, I think we need to do things for shock value. Um, and I don't know what that entails exactly. Maybe it can be done creatively. Um, obviously, as Josh was saying, people who have uh, participated in eco-terrorism have gotten into a lot of trouble and probably has, has totally backfired and hasn't been effective at all. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like my sense is that people are kind of sleepwalking and making all the purchasing, purchasing choices that they're expected to make. And I, I'm enjoying this capitalist, capitalistic lifestyle. I go and I have all the products that I need in my refrigerator, all the food. And, um, you know, I'm comfortable. I have a house to live in and nice sheets. And so basically I, I live a decent lifestyle. So I really can't, I have to be careful about complaining about capitalism when I, I'm obviously enjoying a certain lifestyle that, that's afforded to me, I order stuff from Amazon and it arrives in my house the next day. So, you know, I am participating in it. And I do think that to some degree, capitalism is a reflection of um, the growth and how we trade and how we buy and sell products. And it kind of, to a certain degree, it makes sense. Um, and maybe it's just because we are in the beginning stages of um, hopefully a more mature way of relating to the planet. Um, but obviously what we're doing now, how we are exploiting uh, resources to, to manufacture and buy and sell products, uh, we're not aware of the consequences completely. We hear about it, but first of all, there isn't a lot of transparency. We don't know what the environmental impact, for example, of a phone that we buy might have what minerals went into making them um who made who actually you know what the factory uh, conditions are etc cetera, etc cetera. it's too much information there's no transparency um so it's difficult um i'd like to imagine a world in the future where there can be more transparency and more information if you want it um but I'm not sure how that's going to happen. Um, so I feel like I'm going off on a tangent now. I guess the question was about wealth. Um, I, I can say that wealth has, that wealth inequality has um, grown exponentially over the last few decades and over the last hundred years, actually. I watched a video point which showed graphically how, how that, wealth disparity has grown and I there's something about it that doesn't feel right I don't have a solution for it but I do think it would be interesting that if there was Paul you mentioned you know like there's a ceiling and then there's a floor that you can't go below a certain floor and you can't go below a certain ceiling I can kind of visualize in my mind and I don't know who would set these formulas where if you go over a certain level of wealth, and I'm talking about billions, okay, not even, you know, 250,000 per year or something like that, where you can't um, just hoard, wealth hoarding is somehow not allowed. It's your money, but you have to spend it and reinvest it in some way for those people that are below that floor level. So somehow whatever goes above that level gets recycled back to that lower level. And again, I'm not an economist. I don't know how this would work. Obviously, the, the uh, 
communist model didn't work as we as we saw it play out in China and Russia. I don't think anybody wants that uh, model of communism, but I think there could be smart ways to um, redistribute wealth in a way where those who have wealth can still have some control over how that excess wealth is spent um, and to uh, keep excess wealth hoarding from taking place. And um, yeah, I guess I answered, sort of semi-answered the question about terrorism, which is that I think that we do need to perform some certain things for shock value to stop this kind of like mindlessness that I feel that a lot of people are in. And I don't know what that is because I've I've played out scenarios in my head, I have to admit. I have to go grab the cat again. Um, and was there another question? I forget. I guess that can be it for now. <clears throat> let, let, <clears throat> Bruce, I will get back to you. Thank you, Veronica. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here because I'm, I'm kind of seeing a bit of a, um, I don't wanna say a backfiring of, you know, I promised that I wouldn't give, I'd stay away from spoilers as much as possible because I encourage everybody to read the book because it's, uh, it's you know it's way 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 more complicated than what I presented. I mean it's way way you know it's. <clears throat> yeah, I'm glad I'm reading it. I look forward to reading it. So I, I would encourage people to read it. I want to I want to quick dive in and, and, and clarify some stuff here because. You know the the issue of um, of echo terrorism. I you know I specifically ask a question about that, and uh, and we're getting some good discussions, but I do think I I need to clarify a little bit about the context of of how he presented it in the book. Uh, it, it's a very it was very he got a lot of lot of blowback. There was a lot of discussion generated around it. But the, the, and again, you have to read the book to get to figure this out, but the, the children of Kali did not, they weren't really, they weren't killing civilians to, to terrorize them. What they had in mind, again, you gotta remember this, children of Kali came out of India. And India is set up in the book to be the, the country that leads the process. And the, and the children of Kali made a real simple calculus. You know, a significant portion of, of the greenhouse gases that are being pumped into the air are, is done by the airline industry. And, and you just, that's just the reality. I mean, there's, that's, that's just the way it is. So what do we need to do? We need to destroy the airline industry. And how do you destroy the airline industry? And I'm not saying I'm not justifying this. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that this is in the book how he set it up. How do you destroy the airline industry? You basically start taking down airlines and you and you dry up the the market because nobody's gonna want to get on an airline. And then of course, then what comes out of that, again, here's the spoilers, but I'm sorry. Um, what happens over the next several years after that, after the airline industry collapses is, um, you know, new technologies around dirigibles, which are, are fully powered by, you know, because they can, they can, they can fly above the clouds, above the, the wind currents, and, and they can, these dirigibles can be covered with um, photoelectric cells. They can be, they can be zero carbon generating or zero, and, and not that industry is what replaced the, the airline industry. Again, that's just the story of how it happened. Yeah, but, well, that's, that's the Scott Paul, when you explain that, that they made a calculus, because if you think about the potential of, I mean, if it's clear that millions of people could die if our behavior patterns don't change and the industry refuses to change because of the economic incentives, I can see somebody or a group of people making a calculus and saying, okay, a few people are going to die. 
in, ex in an exchange, we save a lot of lives. Of course, a lot of horrific things have happened in history with that kind of those kinds of justifications. So it's very it's a dangerous line of thinking. But I can I can see I you know I can see why this group would have done that. It's like now even even though we know about climate change, people as soon as they're able to after the pandemic are traveling again for pleasure. So it's like we don't we don't change our behaviors. Right. Well, and and again, I I I don't I did not get the sense in the book that he was advocating for any of these changes necessarily. He's telling a story. He's, un he's unfolding a very complex issue in a very complex way. And I, and I guess, and it's kind of why I, I asked the second question around the, 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 the eco-terrorism is that, um, and again, he presented this very well in the book is that the other thing that's going on is that the clock is ticking, you know. It's great to say we need to have um, value changes at the core of it. But if you recognize that, you know, the spiral as it exists has taken 100,000 years to develop. And we, but so now we have 40 years. And at 40 years, again, this is the premise he's setting up in the book, at, at year 40, the game's over. So you got 40 years to to evolve. And he presents a story again from the outside of step by step by step how it evolve, how it would evolve. Thank you. I mean I'll I'll shut up now. Bruce. Thanks Paul for uh, the presentation and the uh, the good questions. I a while back I I did read um, uh, his uh, series, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, and I highly recommend those. And again, uh, you know, it has to do with the colonization of Mars and, but all sorts of socio-political issues, uh, also involving the earth, also involving climate change. Um, and it's just a very rich story. So he does, um, I will, I'm looking forward to reading this book because I can imagine that you know, it will be very complex and, and rich with, with lots of different, um, you know, basically addre addressing lots of different power uh, dynamics uh, in the book. So <clears throat> I do recommend that series as well. Um, and in terms of billionaires, I'm not sure it's the billionaires so much that bother me as the, as the unequal distribution of power and the ability of people to certain people to have much more power than other people. Um, you know, again, like Josh was saying, I think if you add up, I think it was Josh, if you, you, you know, if you add up all their wealth, it may not be that much more. Uh, but again, the other issue there is the, the, the distribution where some people have so much less wealth, you know, that, that to me strikes me as an issue. Uh, that's maybe more important than the billionaires uh, this existence of billionaires. Um, and so the question then is with any of this, with power is how can that power be, uh, you know, because the people in power aren't going to want to give up their power. So how does this kind of change occur? And, you know, and essentially how can it be subverted? You know, cause I, I think a lot of times when there have been revolutions, when, when, one power system is opposed directly by another. I don't know, know that that works so well. I think it's better to subvert, to kind of go underneath and around. Um, and I don't have specifics on how that would work exactly, but I think that's a better approach. And the third idea I have regarding capitalism is the, I think the, what, we, what needs to happen here is we need to have increased complexity. And with increased complexity, the, you know, the existing, you know, some of the existing structures that we have now can still be there, but with increased complexity, we can have, we can have more that works better. Um, and I think we see this in spiral dynamics in, in, you know, how, how later stages include the previous stages, you know, and it's, it's sort of like the, 
the uh, uh, Hegelian uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You know, the, the the synthesis is at a higher level of complexity. It includes the 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 previous, you know, opposing forces, but now it it it's more more complex. So I think that's kind of how the way we have to go. It's not get rid of capitalism. It's more kind of subsume it into something that works better and fits the conditions that we have, which require change. So uh, that's, that's it for me. Well, one thing I just want to say real quick, since we're waiting is so Ed Abbey, who was a naturalist, but he wrote fiction. He wrote a book called The Monkey Wrench Gang, which was about basically direct action. So mostly around um, property destruction, around protecting the earth, stuff like that. And a movement called Earth First literally formed around his fictional ideas. So hopefully not the terrorism part, obviously, I'm not endorsing that in any way, but fiction can help inspire real life action because it's an easy place to just create an imaginary world versus like well let's create an economic system it's like well you can just play all that out so i'm very glad to see that this is finally becoming more prominent in the fiction world and i hope it means that will that will let me get my book published too <laughs> that'd be good yeah i mean again i I, I don't want to give too much away, but and I'll, I'll reiterate, I, I would encourage everybody in the group to read the book because it's just, I mean, even, I, I'm, you know, it, I, I've found that I've, when I structured the, the thing the way that it did, I'm, I'm realizing I set up my own traps um, because I, how do I, how do I communicate a concept in one slide? And so I, so I, you know, use a catchphrase like no billionaires. Well, he doesn't, the book is not about magically eliminating billionaires. It's, you know, it lays out in detail, step by step by step, how the system that is really not about the billionaires individually, but it's about the, the structures, the seemingly immovable structures in place that create these, these vast disparities in wealth that it do, do exist and they're getting worse and worse. And, you know, the book presents how that's broken down. There's, there's yeah, but even, even if you didn't describe all the details in the book, Paul, those I thought those were still really good questions because what, what the book proposes for the future is not necessarily what's going to happen. So we still have to face, we still have to wrestle with these questions. Right. So I think those questions were good. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Adidas, go ahead. We got some people come want to comment. Go ahead, Adidas. Hi, hello, everyone. Yeah, so I was uh, going through the comments and thank you for giving me a chance. So I uh, really agree with what uh, Josh said about, uh, you know, the structure. So you, if you see in principle, capitalism is basically a merit-based system, right? And communism, when it comes to it, uh, it doesn't really give much importance to uh, the merit. And it's like, everyone's equal, but that is not the truth. Everyone's not actually equal. So capitalism in a way is the one which is, you know, prodding people to move forward in whatever, uh, you know, state they are in mentally, monetarily, physically, because, you know, those people who rise up, they set standards for others to rise up to that level. That is one way of moving forward, right? And capitalism does that. So, so what I'm trying to say is I agree to the fact that if you uh, if we have if you're saying that, you know, this system should be removed or billionaires should be removed or, you know, there should be equality just for the sake uh, or the fact that, uh, you know, people should be treated alike. Uh, we should have a better uh, structure to support that when we are, uh, you know, negating something. What do we propose in return to that? So what is the structure? So what I realized is even I have not read the book. So if, if I, you know, with a little knowledge, if I talk about it, I'll be talking in fragments 
while what we are actually trying to do is talk about entire structure or maybe evolution that we have come across and that's how we have ended up here where we are right now. So we can't just talk in fragments. We have to, you know, holistically look at each and everything which resulted into this and then talk about solution. Uh, that's, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you. Marjorie. Hi. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I've been listening and um, I haven't read the book, but I'm, I'm becoming in inspired to read the book and hoping that it, maybe it's available on audio because I tend to really enjoy audio. I like to actually listen and follow along at the same time with both the print copy and the, and the audio. So we'll see. Um, but it sounds very intriguing. And um, I guess some, uh, some of my responses to some of the questions well, first of all, in fiction, you know, the author gets to control everything, you know, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you can kind of put it, put out a scenario and, and, and uh, you don't have to worry about the unknown variables, you know, and you, you can just kind of let it play out however the author sees that it's playing out. Um, so that's pretty cool, but um, it really doesn't necessarily, you know, relate to um, what what actually either is has happened in the past or is happening or will happen. Um, so there's that. And then um, in terms of capitalism, I think, um, you know, like Veronica was saying, I mean, I'm certainly enjoying the lifestyle of, of a capitalist society. Um, and I don't think that uh, capitalism as, 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 a, as an ism, as a philosophy or as, as, a, as a way of life in, it, in and of itself is the problem. It's the people, the, or the consciousness of the people involved that are the problem. Um, and then also, is it actually even a problem or is it just what it, what, what is? And so, you know, the whole notion of looking at, at life and uh, as thing, anything as an opportunity, um, and then I like uh, what comes to my mind also, there's a, a quote from Gregory Bateson, who was the father of Nora Bateson. And he said, um, flexibility is an uncommitted potentiality for change. So I kind of like that part about uncommitted. Uh, in order to be flexible, you're not committed to any particular ism or any particular philosophy, but you are committed. And my this is me saying this, not Gregory Bateson. Um, I believe that we are committed to, or hopefully we're committed to the evolution of our own consciousness and our own soul and our own being. Uh, and if each person did that one by one by one, you know, um, that's what would change the world, you know. Um, and then the other thing is uh, brings to mind my 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 understanding of Ken Wilber's view on, um, you know, uh, hopefully reaching that tipping point of approximately ten percent of the world's population arriving at second tier, and that would be that big leap that is necessary that would then uh, cause um, the rest of the memes, or not memes, but the rest of the levels to to follow suit or to, to kind of, you know, come up or what, whatever it is that he's uh, proposing with that. I kind of like that. I don't know if it's going to happen or if it it's happening, but it's happening too slowly, it seems. Um, and then the other thing was that also from Ken Wilbur that, you know, you're, you're always going to, everyone that's, every human being born is, comes in at, at, at you know a square one you know you come in it from the beginning of consciousness and so you have to go through all those levels so we're always going to have people at all these various different levels of development and and within our own selves we have all these different levels of development at, at play within our own selves so then it becomes a question of learning how to um, or arriving at a place of being at peace with what is while at the same time doing what we can do you know to take action steps to to move forward so it's very complex um but I, i'm very intrigued by this novel and i'm glad you're not giving away too much because if you did i probably wouldn't be want to read it so 
And I just saw that somebody put that it is available on audio. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I guess I'm complete. Thank you. Ingham, I'll get to you, but Sophia, see if you can get it to speak now. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh I've got my oh. uh, <laughs> headphones on. They work. So I am inspired to read the book now. I heard about it a few months ago and forgot about it. So thank you for that and your presentation. Um, first, I'm not one of the people who thinks that it's easier to imagine the end of the world rather than the end of capitalism. Um, I don't think I could live with myself, really, if that's what I was thinking. Um, and then a question, Paul, does Mr. Robinson go into detail about, well, making an argument for the elimination of billionaires? You know, Thank you for asking that question. And no, he does not. And, and that's what he really addresses in the book is he's, he's addressing, and, he, and he's not even advocating for the end of capitalism. I just said, I don't know how to communicate and stimulate discussion around those issues and do it in, with 15 slides, which you really need to do. <laughs> How do I do it in one slide? Um, he really is addressing at its core, there, there, there's some major themes that he does. First of all, he addresses the, the problems that are coming out of the incredible unequal distribution of wealth and the power that's accumulated on one side of it and the, and the total absolute lack of power that's accumulated on the other side of that. And, and so he does not he does not talk about eliminating billionaires. He talks about, and he doesn't talk about eliminating capitalism. He really talks about how are we gonna change the structures that exist right now? In a, in a, and, in a, and it's, it's why I used one of the examples that I did quote is the, the example that he used of, um, Mondragon Cooperative Corporation that, that um, you know, it's, it's a capitalist system. I mean, it's a capitalist corporation. It's not, you know, and, but what it does do is, you know, they have in place, you know, the, there's, there's a wage ratio. The, the most powerful head of the corporation cannot earn more than, I don't know, 10 times, maybe 15 times what the lowest paid person does. I mean, that's, that's one of the premises of the, of the corporate, of that corporation. You know, it's not organized in a, you know, we're gonna, and it does not look at, at the, the making of profit and the, and the use of capital as an end of in itself. It looks at it as a tool, you know, you need tool to grow, you need tools, you need money to innovate, you need profits to, to, to grow but you don't need excess accumulation of profits on one side of the thing. And so that's how he really structures the book. Um, mm. and, and, and he used the, the you know, Modrigon uh, Corporation as an example of that's, that's, that's how it's being done now. It's a real world example. And, and, I, and I guess I would say one of the things that, that struck me the most about the book, you know, other than, you know, he is one of my favorite authors, is that he he does not wander into wild technological speculations or wild social organization speculations of, you know, if we could just become in everything, it'd be wonderful. He uses as many real world examples um, as he can. And that's, that's how he does. That's a, that was what struck me about the book. Well, in that case, I, so, um, I like that you asked the question and you left us with some questions because just to home in on the, um, what if there was no billionaires? I don't, I'm not talking about the rights or wrong of being a billionaire, but I think it's the attitude and the behavior that goes with it that needs to be questioned. I think that there is overwhelming evidence that the toxicity of orange needs to be managed. And, and for example, 
uh, there was a wonderful article in The Guardian, the British newspaper, yesterday or the day before, written by Marina Hyde, H-Y-D-E. And she, um, <clears throat> she talks about the Tory party donations from the Russian oligarchs and how pathetic the British government has been in imposing so-called sanctions to prevent um, or to do their best to prevent um, the Russians invading the Ukraine. And that there's <clears throat> people who own property in London that the government has done nothing about billionaires who have created the, the, the rise in property prices so that people who are from the local area have to move away. I mean, that's just, that's not okay. In, you know, and a, and a government is responsible for taking care of all of its people. So I think there are, there is a lot of things to be, uh, there's loads of room for improvement as far as managing that toxic orange and, um, and creating a much more equal society, including the payment of taxes. Vodafone, every year doesn't pay what we know over 70 million to the to the British government never mind what it doesn't pay to anybody else because it's more interested in looking after its shareholders I just think that I don't think we can be blase and say oh a millionaire a billionaire or no there they there are measures that can be managed to be able to create the ceiling that that you've brought up so anyway, I'm surprised, I think, that he doesn't go into more detail um, about managing that level of greed. Well, I wouldn't say that he doesn't go into more detail, but, but he doesn't, I will say that he doesn't go into as much detail as he possibly could, um, but then you know, then he'd have to write a 10,000 page novel, which nobody would read. <laughs> I mean, these are very complicated issues. Um, Inga, and then, then, I'll, then I'll get to, to bet. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you so much for the great talk and for the good questions. Um, I, I was thinking about um, the term end of capitalism, that it's, uh, seems unrealistic but it also maybe isn't uh, that um, useful uh, because i uh, i'm from norway we are a social de democratic uh, country and um, i think uh, the main topic should be uh, to how to control capitalism because it's really hard to get rid of it but uh, there are ways to control capitalism there are ways to make more equal distributions uh, uh, among people, so the, I think it's uh, about the question about the billionaires and the question about capitalism. That the, it's the same answer. It's about how to uh, how do enough people be um, conscious, so we choose politicians that actually are willing to take responsibility and control both billionaires and capitalism in general. Um, and um, uh, I, so I think uh, uh, I really look forward to reading the book because it uh, sounds so exciting, the topics that are raised. And uh, the way I understand it, uh, it seems that, um, uh, that uh, like uh, the question about also ecological terrorism, that it will, if, um, if people who want to save the world does terrorism, we have lost all our supporters. So it, it, that will say that we don't, uh, uh, that we have uh, lost um, belief in democracy. If we think uh, terrorism is a valid tool, uh, killing people, uh, innocent people, then we also have uh, um, at the same time, we delete democracy as a way of living. So that's why. So that's why I think it's so useful to that these questions are raised because we can 
it helps us get more aware about the consequences of how we choose to answer the questions that uh, are raised. So thank you. Brett. Okay. Thank you. That was very interesting right before me. So let's see. All right. So I want to talk about Toastmasters as a possible format. And I don't, I haven't synthesized everything, but um, Toastmasters is such an amazing organization and since 2005. And I think it could be, it could teach us a lot about the future. And I think about the future of work a lot and that people love working. And I have all these volunteers in my organization. I just finished being the district director of a 2,500 person organization. And I have people who are up into their eighties who work 30, 40, 50 hours a week on Toastmasters. They're part of like four or five clubs, six clubs. They're officers. They're just loving it. They love it. I can't stop them from working on it. I have to tell them like, please like take some time for yourself. Um, so a few things that are really important that work for this is people take an oath when they join that they're there to serve the other members and help them grow, give them positive constructive feedback, and they're going to do their projects to the fullest of their abilities and just create a positive learning environment. So that's like the first thing is everyone who joins has to have this positive learning environment creation mode. So I think that's really, really critical because people who just want to go there and I don't know, not do that. They, they don't join. And if they do join, they get quickly disenfranchised and they leave. The next thing is it's self-paid. Uh, it's, it's, it's sustained through dues. So we're not collecting, we're not doing like bake sales or like trying to go around and ask people for money, which I think a lot of non-for-profits do. And Toastmasters is 100% non-for-profit. So as a district director, I was in charge of the budget. <laughs> And so everyone pays like seven fifty a month, and it, like it goes to headquarters, and then the district gets back part of it. And they use we have to use that money to like do promotions, run training, and we we cannot hoard the money, okay. And my whole job was like, how do I spend this money? And we spend it on incentivizing our members to do their goals, and to do their goals to get their stuff done. <laughs> Um, to grow and to, to fulfill their oath, which was to uh, to learn and grow. So, so no one's getting paid money. And what we do is we actually pay them in personal growth and applause and thanks. And everyone, I've never seen people more motivated. Like I've managed people in my career. I've been a technical leader, uh, right? I've been a CTO. And the people who are in Toastmasters are so much more dedicated and motivated. So I think that to think that capitalism is, is like the only way to motivate people. I see employees who are just trying to like do the bare minimum, get by so they can do whatever they want to do. And I think if we shift to have a society where people are doing more of the thing they really, really want to do, anyways, I, I think it'd be better, but I don't know how to get there. So anyways, I just want to share that model that could help us think about what is a different way to live besides regular capitalism. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with you at all on that. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm retired now, so I can fully appreciate the value of how much you can gain personally from doing what your, your passions are rather than pursuing making money. Thank you. Bruce. Um, yeah, so one thought, well, first of all, relating to what Bet said, I work as a software developer and it's in a you know fairly agile, what's called agile scrum. And you know, the the orientation is very much oriented around the, the needs of the of the people working. I mean, that's highly valued. And um, I think it does help people to be creative and be included and recognized um, to have some decision-making in terms of what's gonna happen 
going forward. And that works very well. So I think, um, you know, I still work for a, a capitalist corporation, um, but the, but where I'm working, the level I'm working, it's it's um, these other values are included. Uh, so that that's good. And then the other thing about about billionaires and, and capitalists, um, however it's however an economy works or is developed. Uh, there needs to be the accumulation of capital, whether you call it capital. Like in order to build, in order to build a hospital, you need to accumulate the materials to build that hospital. Like there must be wealth has to be accumulated before it can be used, and that's where, you know, in a capitalist system, that's where you have, you know, you know, loans and interest rates and things like that, because without that, you don't have the materials or, or whatever it takes to do that. So, so someone who has wealth generally isn't just like, you know, I mean, metaphorically keeping it under their mattress, they're like investing it. And so that's now providing wealth that's used for other endeavors. Now, of course, that could be invested in ways that are harmful or not harmful, like like all of these things um, are, you know, can be used positively or negatively. But um, and then also with our current system of capitalism, it is very broken because the people in power, I think, are are using their influence to uh, promote the people that have wealth, so that we get a, a larger discrepancy, and you get you know things like the way the the federal, you know, in the, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve System, the way they, um, you know, manage interest rates and things like that. It's not really, it's not really connected to reality. And it's, it's, you know, I think as significant, it's going to, there's going to be significant, at some point, a significant crash and the system can't be recovered. We need it. We need a new system. I don't know what that is. Um, but the current system is very broken, not only not only in terms of the environment, but in terms of the uh, the economy and how that works and how people can live. You know, it, it's it's harming. It's harmful. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought. <clears throat> I'm glad you talked about that because <clears throat> one of the. Again, one of the storylines in the book was what was what was Mary Murphy doing, you know, during all this time, you know, as her as her role as the head of or the minister, whatever I can't remember what her exact title was of this ministry for the future. And she a lot of her work that she was actively doing was going around talking to major financial institutions, uh, you know, both private and public. And, and the storyline that she used is, look, your system's going to crash. Um, and if, you know, your guys are centered around incentivizing activities, just as you said, you got, if you want to build a hospital, you got to, you got to accumulate profit. And you have these systems that allow you to accumulate profit and incentivize investments. And he said, you know, you're, you're incentivizing investments based upon um you're speculating that things are just going to get better and better and better and better and so you 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 place more value on you place because you're, you're assuming that everybody's just going to get richer in the future the, the value of that money is is more valuable now than it is in the future so you discount it you know um and and, and she flipped that and she says you know what if you think about this in terms of the, the value of all the money is going to go away as it's structured now, you know, the system's going to go away. Um, so how do you start to incentivize investment in things that are going to assure the future? And, that, and that's, again, that's that's just one of the storylines that, that she she brings out. It's, you know, I, I talked about it in terms of. Um, um, carbon coin that that's that was that was another instrument that they came up with in the story that but yeah I mean it, it overall it was how do you how do you 
how do you fix the brokenness of the system without break without destroying the concepts the core concepts that do support the system bill go ahead okay thank you um well it's been a great discussion um i really like the question about uh how we can envision the, the end of the world before we can and en uh envision the end of capitalism um can i share my screen here um i really feel like um we've talked a little bit before about polarities I i've asked you whether you guys know much about polarity management um but uh, maybe this is something we should talk about at some point but uh, freedom uniqueness whatnot is part of capitalism okay i mean that that's what it's about and equality connectedness and synergy of the parts is is basically socialism um and the idea is that each side each pole has positives and negatives and so if you have too much capitalism uh, you get too much inequality isolation lack of coordination and the system can fail and the same if you have too much socialism there's a loss of freedom uh, too much sameness excessive conformity whatnot um and that's that's this balance that we have to manage and that's why it's called polarity management and the idea is if you manage it well everything thrives if you manage it poorly then we fall apart uh, and i think that's maybe something to talk about in this group uh, capitalism is not evil uh, but neither socialism uh, it, it has unhealthy components and and healthy components which is part of what the spiral talks about right um there's healthy and unhealthy versions of everything and if you have healthy versions of it then it thrives and if you don't then it falls apart um and there are all sorts of polarities out there um unconditional love versus conditional love uh, mission versus margin which is uh, as a doctor myself i have that i mean um, I, I have to be in the black, but I also have to take care of patients and, and have a mission. And hospitals need to do the same. And it, when, it, when it becomes too much about one or the other, if it's too much about mission, you you go broke. If it's too much about the margin, you you uh, just try to make money and you wind up failing that way too. So um, maybe that's something to discuss in the future. Um, as far as the climate change goes uh, and what we can do about it, I don't know if you've heard about Juliana versus the United States. Um, uh, CBS did a big uh, uh, thing on it one time, uh, 21 kids, I think it was, maybe 18. Uh, anyway, they were under 18 and they sued the United States government for um, the right to clean air. And it's been a very interesting uh, uh, suit. Um, unfortunately, they didn't get as far as they wanted to, but it's an interesting case for you to look up. Um, um, but my, my final comment is, as a, as a biologist, um, species come and go. And um, I don't know what we think makes us any better that, uh, you know, 10,000 years from now, or a million years from now i mean the earth will still be spinning around the sun but um i'm not sure we'll be here uh in fact i think it's pretty likely that we won't be here uh, i mean just think about it. i mean what what's all the changes that we've had my god in my lifetime computers I mean, when, when I went to medical school, we, we didn't have computers, um, fax machines, uh, the, the stuff that's available just in 30 years. Um, I mean, who would have ever thought? I mean, when I was a kid to, to, to make a phone call across the world cost dollars for, per, per minute. Now it's free. But we pay for bottled water. <laughs> Nobody would have paid for water. 30 years ago um 
I mean, it's just, a, it's a different world. Um, but, you know, 100 years from now, 500 years from now, I mean, every bit of oil will be extracted from our world. So what will that mean? Uh, and and 10,000 years from now, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that we're here. Um, that doesn't mean I want to give up like anybody else. But I mean, the dinosaurs came and went. And we might oh, too. The came and went. The what? I said the mastodons came and went. We don't right. even have to go back 65 million years. You just have right. to go back. That's right. You know, 10,000 right. years. Right. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, well, anyway. That's my thoughts. Wow. Oh, there's a cat. There's a Another cat. cat. I'm a dog lover. Sorry. Thank, thanks, Bill. Josh. Yeah, just touching on maybe some of the stuff Bill just said. Yeah, the 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 kids lawsuit. So I I know the guy who's the father of one of the the main kids and stuff like that. And and as touching as it was, it was, it was a PR stunt. And um, I think we got to be careful with thinking that the legal system that is literally not set up to fix any of that shit is going to be the solution. It was a fun thing to do. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, just like the lawsuit to try to sue on behalf of a river. But it's I don't want to say it's a waste of time, but like I, I think we need to be thinking in other ways that are going to really move stuff forward. That being said, it could it could be a part of moving forward the awareness and things like that. But there was no aspect of any of that that was ever going to to win. And and frankly, the idea that children, kids who are living, who are demanding the most consumptive lifestyle that human beings have ever lived, are gonna just blame baby boomers just seems like a another red herring it's like sure i can blame my parents like ah fuck you dad for not caring about this more but it's like it's it's such a it's a surface level addressing of it and and, and frankly it's it's inaccurate right because i'm requiring a ton of resources as well and i don't think that alone is is really going to do it and it may actually prevent us it's just like oh, the god damn you um oil companies that I keep giving a check to every single month, you know, like, I'm not saying that we have alternatives per se right now, but I, I don't feel like the blaming of the thing that we keep kissing the ass of is really going to, to fix things. So I just think that's important. And then regarding whether, you know, human species disappear, true. Um, but we don't have a right to take as many species as we do with us is I think the real issue. So if humans just like, boop, just like surgically <laughs> remove themselves, eh, oh well, but we're not. We're taking a whole web down with us and we extinct more species than we identify. And that's, we can't, we can't keep doing that. But here's my weird new take so as somebody who had been an environmental organizer for 20 years, who was very upset about it, maybe 10 years ago, like really just because ironically, the, the main environmental voices, I will say, in my opinion, are actually doing more harm than good, that the environmental movement has been completely co-opted and is largely, if largely either deliberately or accidentally doing, leading us in a direction that not only won't help, but will harm us. So I, I would question the voices of, of any of the celebrity entities, because I, I think while they're doing a lot of good, they are, um, they're also perpetuating a lot of nonsense because they don't want to look at the root of any of it, because guess what? The root of it is where they get their foundation funding, which is all corporate entities, all based on capitalist economics, they're not going to ever challenge that because then they would not exist anymore. But my new view is hoping, <laughs> hopefully we environmentalists are exaggerating it. Like our, I would say our only hope is that we're exaggerating it. The idea that we're going to fix things if they are really this bad, sorry, there's not a chance in hell. We, we, we literally stood by and watched tens of millions of people die preventatively. 
over the last few years. That's what we did. Don't, don't underestimate what happened over the last two years in terms of just like, ah, what are you going to do, right? I got to go to the movies. So the idea that we're going to shift our entire life and everything like that for something that is as nebulous as the natural world and is a slow unraveling, I don't think we have a chance in hell, but maybe it is not as bad as we're making it out to be. And in fact, when you talk to some of the ones who say like the, and believe I'm probably, con I'm considered an extremist radical environmentalist by 99.9% .9 of the world, but I know the folks who are more extreme than me. And I interviewed them on my podcast. And these are people who are constantly saying every year, we're all gonna die next year in October. That's I think silly. But if you ask them to articulate the situation in which every human being on earth dies, they can't do it. They really can't do it. So I don't think that's what we're dealing with. I think what we're dealing with is a gradual unraveling that is increasingly worse and is causing human suffering and will be causing, is causing human death indirectly um, and maybe directly in terms of some heat waves. But maybe it's not as bad as we're making it out to be. And that's, that's what I hope. That's what I actually hope. <laughs> I, I mean, in, in the short run, it, it may not be as bad as, as what everyone is saying. But, you know, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, it, it's with, with all the nuclear weapons, biological things that, that could happen. Um, I mean, let's just say there was a nuclear war and we annihilated everything and 90% of the species a million years from now, the radiation levels will be down and 10 million years from now, the earth will still be spinning around the sun and there'll be a whole new flora and fauna. And we won't be a part of it. But we will be a part of it though. So I, I hear you on, sorry, I don't want to keep interrupting. I just say this, like I, there's a part of that perspective that I, that doesn't sit well with me, Bill, just because we created that. We did, we did play God if the species that are only going to exist in the future are the ones in which can persist past the stuff that we did. So I do think we need to make a distinction between us doing that and a beaver making a dam and changing a wetland. You know, I, I do think there is something very vast and we need to have the accountability that that we, we are doing things beyond what any species has ever done. And you can make the argument, well, that's just nature. We're operating through nature. I think we're living in the noosphere. We're living in a world outside of nature to a large degree and we create these things. And so I, I just don't want us to shrug off and I'm not suggesting you're doing that, but like beavers chew trees, human beings create nuclear war. It's the same thing. I, I think it's, Oh, I don't think it's the same thing. Uh, it, it, like Robert, Robert Keegan says that his his big idea is that we may live long enough and be mature enough that we can figure this out and save ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we can't. I mean, that's an anthropocentric view, isn't it? That, that we're somehow more important. Yeah, yeah, we're not more important, but we are doing things that no species has ever Absolutely. done before. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. You guys should see my cats. They're polluting so much. Okay. So I have actually been very worried about volcanoes since that Tonga thing happened. And so I started watching documentaries on volcanoes. And then, of course, I found out there's a super volcano right in the middle of America or the you know, north. Anyways, so I watched a documentary on the super volcano. And this, like, there was different experts, and some of them are like, "This is going to destroy the whole world," and some of them are like, "Oh, it's just going to destroy the people who live in this zones." And then there was this one lady who's like, "To prepare for this, you should have seven days of water and food." I'm like, "Okay, really?" <laughs> so, anyways, since I watched that like two weeks ago, I've been making my FEMA. I'm, I'm actually like getting my FEMA supplies. Yeah, duck and cover. So I, I'm getting my water. I bought some MREs and um, I, I feel like it's sort of kind of silly and things. My husband's making fun of me a lot. And being in Oakland, there's like very little storage for me to even put all this water. He's like, where are you going to put all this water? I'm like, I don't know. But 
I, 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 I'm buying like jackets and things. So it's interesting to, to like take action on a risk. And I think volcanoes are a risk that we really need to think about. Um, so you were just mentioning like something that could destroy the earth. I think volcanoes are first and then asteroids. I'm very worried about asteroids, although I don't have a plan <laughs> for like asteroids right now, but I would. And I think I mentioned this last week is like, I, I, I mentioned to my boss that I want to run Meta's um, like earth defense program and I could I can make sure we are focused and trying to do net data analysis on all the top risks. What are the top mitigations? Where should we be investing? And I just look up de water desalination or water dehumidifiers. Because I think water is like everyone can agree water is a big problem. We all need to be thinking about water. And these dehumidifiers are extremely expensive. So I think we should pick like the top 10 technologies and just figure out how to optimize them, use the brain power of the smartest people in the world to fix the actual things that can help. All right, that was a long ramble. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna turn off the, the recording here pretty quick. Bruce and, and Veronica, do you want me to leave it on while you have your comments or what should I do? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. This is straying a bit from the original topic, but uh, bet based on what you said, I think it's great to, to to prepare, you know, start with the FEMA guidelines, maybe go further. There's all sorts of potential disasters, not necessarily the end of the world, um, you know, uh, because if something like that happens, then it's going to be very, very hard to survive. But, you know, it's good to, to uh, kind of do that. And then along the way, that's the opportunity to kind of reimagine things. Like if you have, if you're storing food, then you can cycle that through your pantry. You can decide what foods you want. You can decide, um, you know, you can kind of redesign, you can use it as an opportunity to redesign what you're doing in a way that's more in line with values that have to do with, um, you know, that, uh, that support, uh, support the environment or support how, you know, where you get things from, um, it's just a, it's an opportunity, I think, to be more conscious. And I think that's a, a I think that does actually fit in with the topic. So, uh, so there, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting solar very shortly. And so I will be completely off the grid if, if the, you know, zombie apocalypse, which we haven't mentioned, we really should start talking about that. Zombie apocalypse happens. I'm going to be safe for like a few, uh, yeah, I don't know, 12 days before my MREs run out. 